This episode is up there, top tier, so good. Hey, it's A back on your screen with another one. Hope you're all well. As you can tell, today we're discussing Atlanta season one, episode six, value. This episode right here, top tier, one of my favorites. It's so good. There's so much context, so much for us to talk about. So let's get into it. I, I remember a couple years ago, I watched a YouTube video on typical cinematic tropes, themes, and scenes. And one of them was the dinner scene, how important it is to set the scene, to introduce you to a character or further develop a plot by showing the dissonance in a dinner scene. What better way to show intimacy or lack thereof than two people or a family dining? You can get the tension, the energy, the attraction, the undercurrent of jealousy, whatever it may be, it comes up when you're at that dinner table. And they did so well in this small scene of sharing everything you needed to know about these two characters. So the scene opens up, Jade is on her phone, if I'm not mistaken, she's sitting at a table alone, looks up, and in the blurred distance is Van checking with the host. Van comes over, they say hello, right away you can tell the energy's a little off. But that's normal fare for when you're meeting an old friend, right? I've had those experiences, I'm sure you have. But the rest, I don't know about that, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Personally, me, I would have got up a lot sooner than Van did. That's all I'm going to say. They start talking, catching up. It's very, very, very awkward, especially when Jade starts dragging Van by her roots, literally. The comment about the hair was so necessary. I think it really speaks to the culture of blackness and beauty within their hair. I remember growing up as a little girl when I'd see my great grandma on the weekends. She'd always say, your hair is your beauty as she'd be brushing my hair. And I'm thinking, what about my face? What about my body? What about my mind? It just seemed like such a strange thing to say to an 11 year old, but she'd always say it every time she'd brush my hair. I know she wanted me to take care of my hair. I know she knew that the world, especially the black community perceived hair as beauty, but it was such a archaic and weird thing to not indoctrinate me. That sounds really bad to really instill in me. And it's ironic because when I first started this YouTube channel, what did I start it on? Curly hair care. And when we look at how people are reflecting on the natural hair community on YouTube for what, a decade? There are so many videos about texturism and how certain textures have been pushed out of the conversation and how initially it was meant for 4C, coily textured hair. And now it's been co-opted by that wavy, mixed girl aesthetic. And I have no dog in the fight. I feel like I'm in the medium with my 3C curls, don't come for me. But we've all had a part to play in this good hair conversation. So seeing the back and forth banter between Jade and Van about hair and how Van's like, how expensive is a hairstylist you recommended me? And then homegirl saying he's not cheap. And this idea of access and how if you want to access certain arenas, much like we spoke about with last week's episode, you have to show up a certain way. And there's been countless conversations about black professionals saying that for years they couldn't wear their hair natural in a professional setting because they weren't perceived to be. I've shared stories with you personally about how managers have responded to my flat ironed hair versus my curly hair versus my curled straight hair and perceptions are real. We're just going to leave it at that because we could talk about it a lot and I'm sure you got something to say so you know where to share it. Another part of the scene that really got me was when they were going back and forth catching up but from an undercut kind of way. I said are you guys real old friends or frenemies? You guys are giving toxicity right now between Jay telling Van like you used to laugh at girls like you which very well might have been true, but it's not the type of thing you say when you've seen someone after a long time and you're only in town for three days because you're about that life. And Van throwing it right back at her saying, you know, you're with a different dude. Hmm. Yo, uh, I don't keep friends like this on either side just because I don't need that energy and that vibe. I've been there before. You can hold that. If you guys know my story times, I don't know. Return to sender. So this was giving me PTSD, honestly. What really, really got me was when Van was trying to defend herself and saying, you don't think I'm out too? I'm with guys too. When Jade was saying, Ern is playing you. Why are you with this dusty? Level up. 
And then she turned and said, well, you're doing X, Y, and Z and kind of degrading Jade's escort business or whatever she does. Well, there's a demand. She's a supply. Basically, she's just listing off what she has. She's culture. She's intelligent. She's beautiful. This is what men want. So she's fitting that appeal for the football players, the basketballs, the entertainers. And a lot of Insta baddies are going to say the same thing. And I've spoken to escorts before who've told me, you know, it's not just sex because these men, they can do it with anybody. Let's call a spade a spade. Punani is the same. A lot of guys have told me that before. But what's different is the personality in the person. Sometimes they want someone they can laugh with. They want the fun girl, which is a problem in itself. They want someone they can have intellectual conversations with. Someone that makes them feel home, homely and at peace. I don't know. I'm not a situationship type of girl. I'm not an escort girl, but this is what I've heard. So I'm just going off of that. But I'm sure you've heard these things too. So who's wrong in this situation? Years ago, when this episode first dropped, I was team Van 10 toes down. Now I'm both looking at them sideways like they're crazy because Jade is not wrong, especially when we see where Van ends up. Tough love, maybe not the right direction or messenger, but she wasn't telling any lies. And Van's not wrong about Jade either because who are you to judge my lifestyle? And when I see it, Van and Jade embody two different personality types. Van is the straight and narrow, the educator. She's trying to do everything right. She's, I don't know how she got into this situation with Earn, but I'm going to assume she wanted a family. She's grounded for what we know so far, but we find out that's not really the case. Then we have Jade who loves living that life. She's about it and she's living her truth in her own way. And she's not afraid or shy to say she's not hiding it from anybody. And it's like, who are we on the outside, on the on-site to judge either of them? Which is better, which is worth? It's not really for us to decide. That is the value in it. And I love that Jay talks about value and how she has value and how she wants Van to have value because that's the basis of it. If you value yourself and you're about that life, fine. I'm never going to judge it. If you value yourself and things are unfolding the way you want it to, love it. If you're not satisfied and I really care about you, I'm going to call it out too. Maybe not the way Jay did, but I'm just saying. Then they start to ask about their mom and their dad. Super awkward. Things get worse when there's obviously no resolution, but Jade still fixes herself to slowly take out her phone. Same way I do. Everyone does vertical, but I usually do horizontal. I used to use my phone a lot for vlogging, so it's just my habit. So I was laughing when she did that. And then when she turned on the flash, I said, this is how you know this is from six years ago because hashtag food porn is not that serious anymore. I used to remember working at the restaurants, girls would take the plates off the table, put them on the floor so they could do a better bird's eye view. Why sis, it's never that serious. Plus this place has cockroaches, I wouldn't advise it. Never said that though. What really got me after she took the pictures with the flash was when the two men came in and she's like, yeah, so casually disregarded her because it wasn't bad enough that when Van wanted to order one glass of Chardonnay, which is usually the house wine, so she's trying to be economical with it, no, no, Homegirl says, I want a bottle of Riesling. So not only is it a whole bottle, Riesling is hella sweet. You can get a dry Riesling, check out my Wine Fairy series. Usually Riesling is on the other end of the spectrum from a Chardonnay, so hey, there's a complete disregard and almost disrespect between these two. I'm gonna call them frenemies. So <laughs> Van's like, I'm gonna go to the washroom. The guy that sits next to her is with your coat. She says, yeah, she doesn't even business at this point. Next scene is her walking, dropping her phone, and then Jade rolling up in a nice vehicle, coaxing her with a joint. They go back and forth, and for whatever reason, I'm, I can't explain it, Van actually gets in the car and gets Liddy with her. Who knows how late they were up? Maybe they had a serious conversation, but the one we're privy to with that weird shape angled camera pan it was giving very surface level but again maybe they're old friends i just feel like this is giving us all we needed to know about the lack of comedian connection van has leading up to her breakdown episode that's all i'm thinking of watching these episodes back next morning van is fumbling around trying to find her phone it looks like it's in the shoe box did i see that right this is drug test today of course because that's Occam's razor, right? That's how life would have it. Murphy's law, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so homegirl decides to Google on her phone how to get rid of it and is drinking a whole bottle of Gatorade likes this. That's not going to do anything. She calls up Jade and Jade's like, I don't know. I've never worked a job where it wasn't encouraged. Van asks her to help. Jade texts back saying, nope, sorry. I don't even think the girl tried. She's just too busy living her best life. Ern comes in while she's changing Lottie's diaper. He's actually offering to help with Lottie. 
<laughs> he's always saying weird things to Lottie. There's moments like these where Ern redeems himself for a split second. Yep, we got an adorable baby here, calling back up. I thought that was so cute. And then Lottie was saying something and I'm like, is Lottie asking what's wrong with her mom? <laughs> So then Lottie starts to Google what she can do while she's drinking Gatorade and on a toilet. And I'm like, girl, that's not going to help you. She comes out, asks Ern, can I see your phone? I need to call Al. And then she lies and says it's about a friend who wants to meet him. And it says female friends simultaneously when she's looking at the picture of the woman on Ern's phone. I said, this girl scrolled with the swiftness through Ern's phone. Where does she get that sorcery from? Because I can't get a number and go through the photos app that quick. I don't know about sis, but she, she got an unlock like that. At that point, I'm like, this episode gave everything that needed to be gave. It just went way left after this. She calls up Al. First thing he says is Ern's not here. Bro code goes hard. She's like, I'm not calling for that. She explains what happened. I love that Al takes the moment to mock her because I guess in the past they had a conversation where she looked down on people who smoke. And that's when I realized this episode is a lot of dualities, not just between Jade and Van, two sides of the same table with their values, but now Van and Ern, their place in the relationship and whatever they think they have going on. Now it's Al and Van and their perceptions of weed because to me, it's a herb and it was legal in Canada when this show aired, but obviously back then it wasn't, especially for educators. I was like, just get some piss. <laughs> He's just so casual with it. And she's taking out the trash. She looks at Lottie's diapers and I said, like, no wonder I erased this from my memory. The next scenes, I'm gonna have to work twice as hard to re-erase from my memory. She ends up going breaking bad on us, squeezing and boiling and pouring and cooling and straining into a condom to tape on her legs so it can be room temperature. She's strutting into the school because she knows what she's about to do. Baby P is gonna save her job. This plot line is so ridiculous. And then she gets stopped by a teacher who's talking about a conflict. She gives a resolution with the swiftness. I'm laughing at the flashback of the story because I said they really had to do that. This moment wouldn't have been as hilarious if we don't see what's actually happening to the teacher in real time as she's retelling the story. So why is this kid in white face? Why? Van goes in and she's struggling to open up the stupid con. I said, this is the worst idea ever. Use your earring, pop it in the bag. I don't know. I've never done this. Hope never to do this, but there's got to be a better way. It blows up in her face, literally. It's so disgusting. She goes into the office where the principal asks her, you didn't put in your sample. What's... I smoked weed. <laughs> and this is such an illustration of defeat. What really got me was when the professor said, we all do. But the fact that you shared it with me, I'm going to have to release you to save my ass and the organization. It really got me when she said the line, the system is meant to fail us. That really hurt in a different kind of way. I didn't just see it as the at-risk kids that she's working with, but also the system at large for educators, people that are trying to be straight and narrow, whatever it may be. You see Van's shoulders drop when she thinks that the professor or the principal's on her side. And then when she gets fired, just like, wow, you can't, you literally can't win. Maybe she thought being honest was her last bet, or maybe she thought, you know, I might as well just throw in the towel, but there was this little sliver of hope you could see, and that's why she's such an incredible actor. And then kapoof, gone, poof. Pff. She texts Al, she got fired, he texts her back, and then she goes to class, because luckily the principal was gracious enough to give her till Friday, which I think, I'm theorizing here, they need that time to find a replacement. I don't think they really care. And of course, as she's slowly looking up, who's in the back of her class? Mr. White Face with the weird smirk on. That kid is mad creepy. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the symbolism is for the time because I didn't Google it back then and I didn't have time to today. Something must have happened in the ethers around this time for that to be placed in this episode. But what I could say just from my experience of having family members who are educators and being a student is there's always that kid who's really drawing the line that's trying to draw attention and create chaos in the classroom. Kind of reminds me of Laquarius in episode one, season three, but different energy. Then also this idea that he's putting on white face. How controversial is that? Then also the privilege that comes with being a kid and able to tether that line. But then when we look at what I said earlier, duality, there's so much duality in this episode, which is Van as a fun girl, Van is serious and responsible and having to take care of the family. Who do you get to be and who do you get to show up as? So I just figured, you know what, Van? 
maybe it's a good thing that you got let go because to deal with that and i'm sure you're underpaid so that's that on that i hope you guys enjoyed this breakdown if you have anything to add anything i missed you know where to leave it and until next time stay safe stay sane stay blessed love and later